good day. My name is Andrew Barry Innocent, more commonly called Barry Innocent. November 19th is International Men's Day, and in light of that, I have with me two distinguished gentlemen who will join me in a discussion centered around the aspects of men's lives. I have on my right hand side Dr. Gavin Melvin, and I also have Mr. Guy Futsu. Today we want to delve into some conversation about men in light of International Men's Day, as was said. The, the way we want to do this this morning, we want to look at two aspects. We will have Dr. Melvin look into the importance of screening as it relates to men's health. And Mr. Gifus too will also look at with me the social aspects of a man's life. To start off the, and kick off the conversation, let us start by First of all, asking the question, what really is a man? Or, or how do you differentiate when a boy has moved from a boy into manhood? And I'll just say that something short and then let Mr. Gifford to add on to it. Very, I mean, most of us know that when you are moving from boyhood to manhood, there are some particular physical characteristics. For example, you grow a beard, a little hair on the chest, um, the voice gets a little more deep, and some and certain peculiarities that happen. But today we want to focus on something that is more um, social and psychological. Because I think you know, the way a man thinks is critical. And having said that, let me invite Mr. Gifus to, to tell us from your own perspectives, what, what do you think differentiates a boy from a man? How, how do you know when a man is a man? Um, I believe that um, a man is a man when he takes his responsibility, responsibility as a man uh, and uh, because as an authority he moves in a position where he is under the authority of uh, maybe his parent to the authority uh, to, to assuming authority himself and sometimes having people under his own authority and uh, uh, in that sense, he starts assuming some social function. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Futsu. So I take, I take two things critically from what you said. You mentioned the fact that um, there will be a new dimension of, of his responsibility. Mm -hmm. In other words, whereas a boy might not take his responsibility very serious, he may be more interested in games and, and other things, a man may take a responsibility a little more serious. And he said, you know what? I have a family to take care of. So even if I'm tired, I need to go to work. I'm going to be responsible and get up and go to work because I need to take care of my family. You know, even if I, I even on the job, I may be stressed out a bit. Some days I may not feel like going to work, but you know what? I have a family to take care of, and I have to teach my boy to be responsible. My girl to be responsible. So I'm going to go to work. And also, you also mentioned a very key word: authority or authority. I think also you're right. I think when a man becomes a man, when a boy moves from boyhood to manhood, I think there's supposed to be a greater sense of confidence in the way he speaks. Mm -hmm. He should speak of greater authority, greater confidence, because he is now going to um, contribute to a family in terms of sometimes leadership, sometimes um, projects. And I think it's critical for him to be able to speak of confidence and teach his son to speak of confidence and speak of his daughters or his children generally to speak of confidence. So I, I like these two points. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is, Mr. Futsu, I'm diving everywhere into the aspects of, 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 of a man, being a man. What is your relationship like with your, your dad, if I may ask? Um, first of all, growing up, I, I would say I didn't have only one dad. Okay. <laughs> I, I have my biological dad. I didn't live with him, but I also have my uncle with whom I live. And um, the father figure for me was both of them. And even many other uncles who were always there, wow. they would approach me, they would guide me. And um, it was more like uh, mentors okay. because they would take me on when they want to do certain things. They would go with me, they would hold my hand and, and do those wow. things with me, teach me how to, how to be a man. To, to say Great. it that way, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. I, I have a similar experience myself. I had more or less like two, two fathers. I had my grandfather who I was brought up 
with most of my life. And then I had my father, who I also saw every day, but he was my real biological father. Mm -hmm. And um, both of them played a critical role in my, in my development into becoming a man. For example, uh, my grandfather, whenever he leaves the house, the first thing he does before he drives off his vehicle, he opens the bonnet, checks the radiator for water, checks the oil, checks the other things, and then he starts up and leave. And I used to be watching from the balcony, watching this. Now, now that I'm a man, to be honest with you, I still cannot exercise the kind of discipline he did. I would do that about once a month, <laughs> or twice, or, 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 or every two weeks, but not the kind of a way he, he if such discipline, you know, before he leaves, before he drives off, he checks his vehicle for the tires and all that, you know, like a culture, like a lifestyle, mm -hmm. which is which, which I, it all goes well for me because I try to do it every now and then, but still not as well as he does it. So yes, you know, and, and I like the fact that, you know, apart from your dad, you had the uncles, the, uh, similar to me, I had a, a, a barrage of uncles around me who also served as mentors in various aspects mm -hmm. of my life and develop my development. So let me just, before the break comes, let me just try to switch to, 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 the, to men's health and, because we have our distinguished um, doctor here, Dr. Gavin Melvin. Um, Dr. Gavin Melvin, can you tell us about the importance of screening as relates to men's health? Thank you so much for having me today, Barry. Um, first, let me define screening so okay. that we understand what I mean by screening. Right. Screening defined medically refers to checking an asymptomatic individual, somebody who does not have evidence of an issue, okay. for a particular issue in the hope that you can find it early and you can perhaps treat it at an earlier stage so that less damage is done. Interesting. Um, so just one little pin, if you'll permit me. No problem. On your, the last part of your conversation. Um, when boys grow to men, you should always remember that it's a process. And sometimes it mm -hmm. can be a longer process for some than others. Yes, and yes. It's That's very true. useful as mentors ourselves in whatever sphere of influence we have that we appreciate that not everybody is going to grow up as fast as everybody else. And we give them both room to do so and direction in doing so. Just a little pin I wanted to add. Can I, to can I ask you to extend on your pin in terms of, yes. um, well, we only have about a few minutes left but for the first phase, but um, when you say give them room, can you expand a little bit on that? OK. Um, each person, each child is different. Okay. and their requirements for every aspect of their development is different. Okay. Um, this is shown most obviously in multi-children families. You have one child who is utterly quiet and another child who is totally rambunctious and <laughs> all over the place. Um, so appreciating those differences um, should allow as a parent, as a mentor, for you to um, give each child the specific environment that they need to right. develop to the best of their ability. Right. Some children may need more love, some okay. children may need more discipline, some children may need both love and discipline, some children may just need more food. So whatever <laughs> it is, whatever it is that the child needs um, to develop optimally um, as a mentor or parent, it is useful for you to recognize those differences so that you can provide them for the children. Very often, um, we tend to put everyone into a box. And yes. By 18, you should be X, Y, and Z. It isn't necessarily so. Some children are that way at 16, some at 15, some at 22. Right. That is how it is. So right. recognizing that allows, them to, allows us to help them optimize that very significant transition from, in the case of our discussion today, boyhood to manhood. Yes. So that's, that's what I meant when I, yeah. when I said v Very that. insightful. And you've led us into um, the fatherhood a bit. Um, so we will stop right now for a short break, and then we will continue and go back into that. Um, viewers, thank you so much for listening thus far. Please don't go away. Please stay tuned. We'll see you. We'll be right back. Thank you. Oi, you I realize you step on my toe. Well, do something about it. Gasai, bust in that man. Hold on. 
If somebody try to cross you, Hola. and if my thing start to take you, Hola. no need for war or violence, cause the police there to help you. Hola. If a trouble start in this session, alright, no need for aggression. Hola. We don't want no violence in the place. Hola. 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 Control your temper, right. respect each other. Don't let no trouble escalate, cause you know better. Control your temper, respect each other. Don't, do don't let no trouble escalate, cause you know better. Control your temper. A message from Mission Boys, Studio 758, Acid Creations, and the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. Welcome back, viewers. Thanks for staying tuned. You know, before we had stopped for the break, Dr. Melvin had expounded on some nice insights. He was talking about giving room, you know, because he says from boyhood to manhood, it's a process. And I think that giving room phenomena, I would like to just speak a little bit about it because oftentimes you find when a father becomes a legendary in some way or the other, whether it's a very good musician, a very good doctor, a very good lawyer, there's a great tendency for wanting his son to just follow that same pathway. It happens with preachers also. But it's good for us as fathers to understand, hey, um, that, that may not be what they are designed by God to do. That may not be the area of gifting or the area of passion. And it's important to let them work within the area of passion or gifting. Because when you work in your, in your area of passion and gifting, it's almost like you don't even feel tired because yes. you, are, you like what you're doing. So I think it's important, as Dr. Melvin mentioned, that we give room. If you see your child as a father is not taking the same professional inclination as yourself, don't be too disarrayed about it, but um, see what happens. See what they're naturally good at and, and explore it, help them develop it. Because they, they might just be not a, good as, not a good doctor as yourself, I should say, but they may end up being one of the world-renowned lawyers or world-renowned engineers and they even be a, a scientist so we need to as dr melvin mentioned we're not we should always ensure that you know we allow the children to, to that room that space to become who they are on the inside what they have a passion for what, what they are gifted in so i just wanted to explain that a little now going back to the conversation so we looked at the fatherhood a little bit dr give um sorry mr give for food spoke about um his with his dad Let's take on a little, a little different twist now. Can you tell us about what's it like being a husband? You know, for, for you as, as, a, as a husband, of, you, have a, you have a, I think, two, one kid? Mm. As a husband and a father, how does that dynamic work for you? A husband, uh, I think uh, being a husband is actually, as we mentioned earlier on, is a step in, is another step. I would yes. say, um, in stepping in, assuming some level of responsibility, but also partnership, because okay. it's a relationship with a person who is also a, a complete person, just like me, and uh, we have to discuss, we have to listen to each other, and also um, uh, collaborate in raising out, raising up the. the the, ch the children and um, it is a learning process yes. being a husband is a learning process I, I, I like sometimes to say um, is a high school <laughs> is high school uh, for of life if you can say that it's high school uh, yes. a certain yes. level because we learn to know ourselves better as someone else step in and can tell us uh, things about ourselves, uh, things, some things that we know, some things that we don't necessarily know or we are not aware of, and someone that we can trust. Mm -hmm. Because other people can tell us things, but uh, it's not the same as yes. uh, a wife with somebody you trust, somebody you are committed to, and who can step in and help you in uh, being fulfilled in what, who you are, uh, who you are called to be. And uh, being a father is also another step in school. Sometimes I call it is the university of life. <laughs> <laughs> because I realized um, how much I needed to learn after we, we have our son. Um, and I, re I also learned who the, my, limit, my own limitation uh, because uh, I, through my son, I could see myself. I could wow. see 
how I grow or the steps that I have, I have to go through. I have to learn to be patient. Yes. Uh, certain things that I know and I think it's obvious, I see that I need to teach the child, I need to help him understand. And sometimes I need to, to be patient with him. Uh, yes. And I realize, wow, so some people have been patient with me <laughs> to move from <laughs> this stage to this stage. So it's a learning process and um, building up this relationship, uh, partnership, relationship, partnership relationship with, with the spouse, but also um, this mentoring relationship with the, with the, with the child yes. that we are trying to help grow. Uh, it teach us to, to, uh, to, to know ourselves better, but also to help someone else to develop to where we are. Very interesting. Well, can we have a look at you on add to that? <laughs> yes. Um, just briefly before I get back to what I wanted to say in the first place. Um, I think that in seeing ourselves in our children, particularly sometimes in the people we're mentoring, um, it often perhaps creates what you were talking about earlier on, about us not giving our children room to grow. Um, very often, as adults, we try to um, see our best selves in our children, and sometimes even enforce our best selves in our children. And it can lead to conflict, it can lead to challenge, and it can lead to not necessarily good outcomes every time. Yes. So I think it's useful to recognize it so that, again, we can give our children room to grow into their best selves, even if, even if it's a little different from what we imagine yes. that our best selves or theirs would be. So, yes, that's, that's what I wanted to add before I get back to when you allow me to <laughs> what we were discussing before. <laughs> yes. Well, um, let me just um, highlight something that uh, Mr. Futsu said in terms of the partnership and the unique, uniqueness of, of persons. Um, yes, I, I really like that, that um, when you're married to someone, it's a partnership, so you're doing things together. And, uh, but there's also an aspect of the, each person have their own form of individualism or uniqueness of personality. With my wife, for example, my wife, although I'm a man and most men like cricket, I'm not a big lover of cricket. I, I watch cricket now and then, but my wife loves cricket. Now, just to please her sometimes, mm -hmm. I may just watch a match for her too, you know? But it's not my, a big, big, big deal for me, but it's a big, big deal for her. So in the partnership sometimes, to make one another happy, I just mm -hmm. watch a match for her. Whenever the, the West Indies thing is in I try to bring her there, I know what she likes, mm -hmm. you know? I'm, I'm quicker to sit down there and listen to something on YouTube that I can pick up some knowledge from, you know? Mm -hmm. But she's uh, more the, 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 um, the cricket fan. So it's important for us to understand that and don't try to force the power partner to, mm -hmm. to be inclined to the same things that we do. Mm -hmm. Like Dr. Melvin said, that then creates conflict. Because mm -hmm. you're, you're a partnership, but you also have your own individualism of mind. Mm -hmm. Now, having said all that, and time is going, I want to open the make, make room now for Dr. Melvin <laughs> to talk about, tell us more about screening, because I know that yeah. men's health is a critical thing in solution. Yes. Thank you again, Barry. Um, like I said before the break, screening represents looking for disease processes that have not yet shown symptoms in the hope that you can catch it at an earlier stage and fix it. And there are many recommendations for screening for men and women, and those screening recommendations mm -hmm. differ based on age generally and risk. Okay. So, for example, a man who has had relatives with prostate cancer should probably be screened for prostate cancer earlier than a man who okay. does not have such a history. Mm -hmm. That's just one example. Yes. And there are several recommendations for screening for men. Now, the list is long, and it would take a whole conference to go through all of them individually. So I just wanted to perhaps highlight maybe two or three of them. Um, the one that is most feared and most discussed and most shunned, perhaps, is prostate cancer screening. Okay. Um, so prostate cancer. Prostate cancer screening represents, should represent, let me say it this way, 
a discussion between a patient and a physician as to when, what method, and how screening should be done. Okay. It is not a one-size-fits-all. Um, unfortunately, uh, as black people, we have a genetic predisposition to enlargement of the prostate as we get older and prostate cancer, which tends to be more aggressive. Okay, mm -hmm. Dr. Melville, we're going to stop with you for sure. a short break. I want, don't lose your train of thought. I shall. Um, when we return, we will just continue. To viewers, very important information coming here. So please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you. Pamela, I noticed that you built your retaining wall on my property. You will have to give me my land back or compensate me for that. My contractor isn't dumb. I trust that he will not build anything on your property. Where is your proof? Let's go to court. This situation does not require you to go to court. Looks like we have to go through mediation here. Mediation is a way people resolve conflicts like this. Someone, a third party, comes to speak to both parties. This person is called the mediator. The mediator is impartial. He or she makes sure that communication between both parties is effective and efficient. So, the mediator is a judge? No, the mediator is not a judge. Mediators, unlike judges, do not decide cases or impose settlements. Let me get a mediator to handle this retaining wall and that kitchen. Kitchen? Yes, your kitchen also falls on my land. Let me call the mediator. Welcome back viewers and thank you for staying tuned. Dr. Melville, mm -hmm. before the break you were saying some very critical things. Let me let you continue. Sure. Um, before the break, I was saying that uh, one of the more feared uh, screening tests um, that men um, run away from is prostate cancer screening. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about it and some of the other screening um, methods and disease processes that we should screen for as men. Um, because they are illnesses that, for which we can intervene, okay. and intervening early makes a difference in the outcome. Um, prostate cancer screening basically has three parts. One is a, an examination, which is the part that most men fear. Okay. Um, strangely enough, having had screening exams, most patients, most men that I see, ask a simple question afterward. That was all. So I think it is more an issue of stigma being attached to a okay. procedure rather than actual discomfort or actual um, challenges with the screening exam. But it is a necessary part of getting older. It's a necessary part of any man getting older, especially a black man. Yeah. So. Um, screening for prostate cancer includes a rectal examination where the physician actually touches the prostate and see how it feels and see how big it is. Also includes a blood test. It may include a blood test to check the levels of uh, substance produced by the prostate. Okay. PSA. Yes. If it is elevated, then we know that there's a possibility that something is going on and we should look further for it. Um, and it may include additional tests, such as MRI scans, ultrasounds, biopsies, and all that sort of stuff. C can I ask a quick mm -hmm. question, why is we on prostate cancer? What are some of the typical symptoms and signs that one should look for if one would have any form of prostate issues? That's a challenging question to answer, simply because um, the issue that is happening with the prostate dictates the symptoms that a patient has. Okay. So, for example, very often early prostate cancer is asymptomatic, which oh. is one of the reasons it's a good disease to screen for. When a patient has symptoms from prostate cancer, that either means that the cancer is large enough to cause obstruction or that they, there has been spread of the cancer to somewhere else. Okay. So very often early prostate cancer has no symptoms wow. and that's the point i was making earlier wow. on hence the need for screening right. um i'm not sure how much more time we have but just to 
point out that other screening tests that are necessary, screening for hypertension, screening for diabetes, especially in overweight men, wow. um, screening for depression, screening for bowel cancer. Um, there are, there's a significant percentage of um, patients in St. Lucia who die from bowel cancer, who die from prostate cancer. And these are uh, disease processes for which we have tests to detect them early. And in some cases, the test that we use to detect the issue can also be curative. It can get rid of the issue. So for example, if a patient does a screening colonoscopy, a special camera looks in the bowel to see if there are any funny spots there, okay. it is possible that by taking out that funny spot, you have prevented a patient from going on to develop cancer. So it can wow. be both diagnostic and curative at the same time. Wow. So if you have not taken anything else from what I've said today, the main thought that I'd like you to get is that there are tests available. Well, first, let me step back one second. Not because you're feeling fine, and you don't have a symptom means that nothing is wrong. That's mm -hmm. the first issue. A lot of patients think that if something is wrong, they will feel a particular way, and that is not necessarily true in many, many, many cases. Wow. Um, from heart attacks to strokes, neither of those two disease processes started with the heart attack or the stroke. They started 10 or 15 years before with high cholesterol, yes, yes. which actually you should be screened for also. So. First thought is, because you do not have a symptom does not mean that everything is fine. That's the first thought. The second thought is, have a discussion with your doctor about which screening tests are appropriate for you. While there are many guidelines, pretty much every significant medical organization has their guidelines, those guidelines may not necessarily apply to you as a patient because your family history may be different, your yes. own personal history may be different, you may have had other conditions that predispose you to something else. So my second important point is have a discussion with your physician regardless of what age you are about which screening tests are important to you as a patient. And if we do that often enough, we have the opportunity to intervene earlier and perhaps change some of the outcomes okay. um, in later life. Okay, very, very important information. Uh, the, the greatest um, point for me is the importance of screening because as the doctor said, a lot of these uh, sicknesses are like silent killers or, or there's not much symptoms and signs to look out for on the outside. So screening can save you when it comes to that aspect. We don't have much time, so what I'm going to do at this point is invite um, my distinguished guests to give some final words. So um, before I go to Dr. Melvin, who just finished, I'll go straight to Mr. Futsu. Uh, any final words of advice to husbands and fathers as your final words before we end? Yeah. Um my final rule will be on the fact that we need to keep in mind that we, every human being, fathers, we are under higher authority. And uh, um, even when we are given the, uh, uh, we have the opportunity to exercise authority or to mentor or coach someone else, mm -hmm. we always need to keep in mind that we, are, we ourselves are under authority, a higher authority. Um, and uh, everything we do, we, we need to keep in mind that we have to give an account on, yes. on it. And this should guide us uh, and keep us also accountable uh, in some way in what yes. we do. Yeah. yeah, that's true because God Almighty is watching us as, as fathers and as men. Yeah. You know, that we are accountable to him, that we have yes. become good stewards mm -hmm. of what he has given us to, to, to lead. Exactly. Dr. Melville, any final words? Yes. Um, first, 
thank you for having me. And I really do hope that we get the opportunity to spend more time and to get into mm -hmm. more detail about um, several of these yes. um, topics that, yes. that came up today. Um, I would just um, advise each of us to begin to take the responsibility for ourselves. While I started out my conversation speaking about screening, it's always getting back to the basics that yes. matters. So each of us, to maintain our health, to stay healthy, um, it starts with eating right, reducing alcohol, reducing weight, and exercising, mm -hmm. reducing our salt intake. Okay. Okay. Those, those are the five basic things that is the starting point for managing anything. Okay. Um, and I can illustrate it briefly. Cancer patients who are previously healthy, who were healthy before they got cancer, yes. do better than patients who get cancer who are wow. not healthy before. So even if something goes wrong, being healthy, eating right, reducing your alcohol intake, all contribute to you doing better, even if something goes wrong. Patients who exercise, who reduce their salt, who are not overweight, generally have easier blood pressure management if they become hypertensive. Wow. So um, back to the basics, eat right, reduce your alcohol, reduce your salt intake, reduce your weight, and exercise at least five days a week, half an hour, and wow. it will be the starting point for um, better health overall. There you have it, folks. Very good, very good advice. My last piece to it all is that uh, remember, as Mr. Guy said, that uh, as fathers and as men, we have responsibilities all around us, and it is important for us as men, especially when you're busy, put your child and your, and your wife and your family in your schedule. Don't leave it to chance. But sometimes you get a call and you get to run out to run out, but put in your planned week of activities, put time in there for your wife and your child. That's my last piece of advice to some of the very um, managers out there. I know how busy your managers can get. Put your kids and your wife and your family in your schedule in your planner. Thank you for your time, folks. We will, we will be having another, point, another sort of discussion at some point in the future. I'm looking forward to it, and I know that you'll be blessed for it. Have a good day.